Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankaray's Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description box. They are also displayed in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. This discussion is based on a draft notification that has been released recently by the Union Environment Ministry. In the draft notification, the ministry prohibits installing membrane based water purification by the users and two days ago an article has appeared in the Hindu newspaper with respect to this matter and today an editorial has appeared on this issue so first let's discuss the news article that has appeared two days ago then we'll come to the opinions of the author raised in today's editorial the syllabus relevant for the analysis of these news articles has been highlighted here for your reference See, the draft notification prohibits users from installing membrane-based water purification. Mainly, it prohibits users from installing reverse osmosis systems in their homes. See, this prohibition is applicable if the water has been sourced from a water supply that meets Bureau of Indian Standards drinking water norms. Now, let's see the background of this notification. See, the ministry has issued this draft notification to comply with an order of National Green Tribunal. See, in that order, National Green Tribunal has prohibited use of reverse osmosis purifiers in places where TDS in supplied water are below 500 mg per liter. TDS refers to total dissolved solids. So, what do we mean when we say reverse osmosis purifier or RO purifiers? See, normally when we say osmosis, it refers to passage of water or diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane that blocks passage of dissolved solutes. Here water is solvent and the pollutants there can be called as solutes. So in this osmosis process, water moves through semi-permeable membrane from low salt concentration region to high salt concentration region. This difference in salt concentration is actually the driving force of the water to move from low salt concentration to high salt concentration. So end of the day, there will be equalization of salt concentration on both the sides and this happens under natural conditions. But when we come to reverse osmosis, here an external pressure is applied to overcome osmotic pressure. Now osmotic pressure is what makes the molecules in the water to move from low salt concentration to high salt concentration. So in reverse osmosis, there has to be an external pressure to overcome this osmotic pressure. Because of this, the water will move through semi-permeable membrane from higher salt concentration to low salt concentration region. So this reverse osmosis or RO process is a liquid driven membrane process. We are saying this because the RO membranes are capable of allowing solvent that is allowing water to pass through whereas at the same time the membrane will reject the solutes which are salts or low molecular weight organic materials. So know in brief about osmosis, reverse osmosis. So this is the technical definition but simply we can say RO is a technology that is used to remove large majority of pollutants or contaminants that are present in water. These are carried out by pushing the water through pressure through a semi-permeable membrane. So how does this reverse osmosis work? Now if you see this diagram, now from this diagram you can understand how RO works. See reverse osmosis works by using a high pressure pump to increase the pressure on salt side of reverse osmosis. That is when we say salt side, it refers to the side that contains saline water. And the pressure forces the water across semi-permeable reverse osmosis membrane. So this process leaves or this process helps to reject almost 95 to 99 percent of dissolved salts. The rejected salts will flow th along with water in a separate stream called as the reject stream. Now the amount of pressure that is required is actually dependent on the salt concentration of the water that is feeded into the process. The more the concentration, more pressure is required to overcome the osmotic pressure. Now the desalinated water which is also called as demineralized water or deionized water is called as permeate water or product water. Now, the water stream that carries the concentrated contaminants that did not pass through RO membrane or that are rejected by the RO membrane is called as reject stream. 
Now, the main problem with reverse osmosis process is that it rejects large volume of water along with the solutes. We can observe this thing in the RO water filter that we can that uh, we may be using in our homes. We can see that through one pipe, water will be flowing to the drainage or to the sink. This is the rejected water. And if you try to fill this rejected water in a bottle, we can actually measure how much water is wasted in our RO system. And the wastage is quite high. And according to RO manufacturers, they are saying only 20% of feed water is recovered, whereas 80% goes as waste. This was actually one of the reasons for banning reverse osmosis processes in the order of National Green Tribunal. Another reason was the concentration of total dissolved solids. The concentration of TDS is actually one way of measuring the purity of water. TDS in water is actually made up of inorganic salts along with small amounts of organic matter. World Health Organization prescribes TDS levels below 300 mg per litre for the consideration of excellent water quality for drinking water and it says that TDS levels of 900 mg per litre to be poor and above 1200 mg per litre to be unacceptable for drinking. See, according to expert committee found by National Green Tribunal, it is a fact that RO technology is generally not required for places which have piped water supply. These are piped water supplies that are from municipal corporations or municipalities. The reason is that these piped water supplies are generally from surface water sources like rivers, lakes and ponds and they have low TDS levels compared to groundwater sources. Simply we can say groundwater sources are nothing but bore water. Another reason is that while 80% of feed water goes as waste, RO systems are not required for places where they receive water which have low TDS level. And the expert committee constituted by National Green Tribunal recommended that installation of RO plants is advisable for the sources having TDS levels above 500 mg per litre. And this level is acceptable limit as per Indian standards for drinking water. So it is in this regard National Green Tribunal has noted that RO technology has its own space, particularly in areas where there is high TDS and multiple pollutants. And NGT has also noted that universality of RO technology will create long-term problems rather than giving short-term solutions if this technology is allowed without addressing its limitations. In addition to these reasons, there is one another reason for the order of NGT, that is the issue of deficiencies caused by RO system. This is because the RO system also removes important minerals that is vital for human beings, for example, like calcium, magnesium. Because of the removal of important minerals, the health of consumers of demineralized water or deionized water or desalinated water is also adversely affected. So based on this reason, NGT ordered prohibition and regulation of consumption and use of low TDS water. The order mandated the reverse osmosis manufacturers to maintain minimum TDS concentration of 150 mg per litre or at least to maintain the minimum levels of calcium and magnesium. So as a whole, NGT noted that wastage of water can be prevented and wherever RO systems are to be permitted, remineralization and other regulatory measures may be required. And wherever RO system is not required, it can be prohibited in the interest of water conservation. So finally, NGT issued directions to Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change so that the ministry may issue appropriate notification to prohibit the use of reverse osmosis where TDS in water is less than 500 mg per litre and wherever RO is to be permitted, a requirement needs to be laid down for the recovery of water to the tune of at least more than 60% normally and provisions need to be laid down for the recovery of water up to 75% in future. Here when we say 60% or 75% we are referring to the fact that about 60% or 75% of the feed water has to be recovered. In the present RO systems we saw that only 20% of the feed water is purified. Remaining water is rejected in the reject stream by the RO membranes. The NGT also ordered for reuse of RO reject water for the purposes such as washing utensils, flushing, gardening, cleaning of vehicles and also for floor mopping or cleaning. So it is based on this order. Now the Ministry of Environment has issued a draft notification. We are saying draft notification as draft because the provisions in the notification might change once public comments are received and once they are taken into consideration. And after that, the final notification will be published in the Gazette. The notification is titled in the draft as the Environment Protection Amendment Rules 2020. See, it aims to amend Schedule 1 of Environment Protection Rules 1986. 
See the schedule one of the environment protection rules 1986 prescribe standards for emission or standards for discharge of environmental pollutants and this proposed amendment tries to insert a provision for regulation on use of membrane based water purification system here membrane based water purification system involve purification system with microfiltration process through a semi permeable membrane so the regulation will be applicable where the membrane based water purification system is installed or operated for the supply of portable drinking water but it is not applicable for sea water reverse osmosis systems see these are systems that are either installed at point of use or point of entry or at commercial and industrial premises here point of use refers to a system where water purification system is located close to the use point and this system will deliver water directly to kitchen sink through a single tap or multiple tap facilities and when we say point of entry it refers to location of water purification system at the point of entry of water to the premises in the system most of the water entering the premises will be treated so the proposed regulations prohibit the installation or use of membrane based water purification system at the point of use or at the point of entry for the purpose of purifying supplied water which is already subjected to conventional flocculation processes filtration processes and disinfection processes here when we say flocculation it is a process in physical chemistry where solid particles in a solution will be separated by the process of formation of loose aggregations or soft flakes and installation of use of this membrane based water purification system is also prohibited if the supplied water is from any sources that are in compliance with acceptable limit for drinking water as prescribed by bureau of indian standards and according to current standards the acceptable limit of tds is 500 mg per liter i know that the permissible limit in the absence of acceptable standards of water or in the absence of an alternative source of drinking water is 2000 mg per liter it is recommended that acceptable limit is to be implemented but if the tds is more than the acceptable limit then it means that the water is not suitable for drinking but still it may be tolerated in the absence of alternative source and this toleration limit is what is actually called as the permissible limit and the toleration limit should not be more than the permissible limit that is above the permissible limit the sources will have to be rejected you can also observe there is a huge variation in the water quality standards prescribed by indian standards face to face or visa vis the world health organization now according to the editorial drinking water from several state water boards and city water boards are actually as per baa standards but water sources at the homes for example bore water they are actually not up to the mark so in such a situation we cannot actually prohibit water users from using reverse osmosis processes the author also mentions the ranking by bureau of indian standards last year in this several cities were ranked based on official water supply quality in this ranking delhi was ranked at last whereas it was found that only mumbai city met all the standards and the editorial also notes one another important point that the bas norms are voluntary for public agencies which supply piped water whereas bas norms are mandatory for bottled water producers in this situation we cannot expect adherence of bas norms by the public agencies in addition to this most of the country do not have the luxury of piped water and it is also said that available water supply is also contaminated we are saying these statements as confirmed by niti ayog in the composite water management index and according to composite water management index nearly 70% of water supply in india is contaminated and because of this india is ranked at 120th position among 122 countries in the water quality index see this water quality index is released by a non governmental organization called as water aid so based on these important facts the author's opinion is that it is not advisable to restrict the choices of the people to ensure portable drinking water through the means such as oro processes so the author suggests that the primary aim or objective of the draft notification should be to persuade the authorities to upgrade and to supply bas standard water to the consumers rather than imposing restriction on the users particularly at homes so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of these news articles now let's move on to the next news article
This news article is with reference to Services Business Activity Index. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. News article mentions that IHS Market India Services Business Activity Index rose from 53.3 in December 2019 to 55.5 in January 2020. This increase in this index signals strongest improvement in service sector output in last seven years. So this means that India's services sector activity has actually surged or increased to a seven-year high in the month of January 2020. The reasons for the sharp increase is mainly because of new business orders and these fresh business orders were mainly generated from the domestic sector. And the report from IHS market states that the new business orders have led to job creation, business optimism and it is possible mainly because of favorable market conditions and better demand for services sector operations. So what do we mean when we say services business activity index? See it's a services sector index. It is published by IHS market. Now this IHS market is a leading information source with respect to critical areas in business landscape in the world. The global headquarters of this IHS market is located in London. They are carrying out survey for uh, manufacturing sector, services sector, whole economy for that matter construction sector, retail sector. For all these sectors in economy, IHS market has defined a concept called the headline index. Now this headline index is seasonally adjusted index in survey for each sector coming to services sector in IHS market. The headline index for services sector is the services business activity index. And they also release such indices for manufacturing sector. In manufacturing sector, the headline index is manufacturing output index. So this services business activity index is actually almost comparable to the manufacturing output index. This IHS market actually releases a manufacturing purchasing managers index which is a weighted composite index and the services business activity index is also sometimes referred as services purchasing managers index. But unlike manufacturing purchasing managers index, which is released by IHS market, the services purchasing managers index is not a weighted composite index. Actually in the services sector, this IHS market releases a number of indices. The headline index is this business activity index. So simply this services PMI is actually an index that is designed to measure changes in total business activity in the services sector. And they are also saying that it is a diffusion index, meaning that uh, it is a convenient system used by this IHS market to convert different survey responses into a single number reading. The components of the survey will be asking respondents to report about the output in the particular sector, say services sector, also the employment numbers, whether it has uh, increased or it has remained unchanged or whether it has fallen during a survey period. So such an index is actually calculated from a question that asks for changes in the volume of business activity for a particular survey month which is compared with the previous month. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. You know that IHS market releases a services business activity index which is a headline index released by them in the service sector. They know that manufacturing output index is one of the index released under manufacturing sector by this IHS market which is the headline index under the manufacturing sector. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article is about some myths and fake messages that are circulating in the social media with respect to novel coronavirus. The news article reports that such kind of messages are spreading in internet through WhatsApp and social media platforms in the state of Maharashtra. So in this article, we'll see some kind of myths that are being circulated across social media and also the responses that are given by public health officials of Maharashtra and the World Health Organization. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. And since December 19, we have been seeing uh, various news articles related to this novel coronavirus. And very recently, in last week, World Health Organization has declared novel coronavirus outbreak as public health emergency of international concern. So one of the myths that are being circulated is that garlic, curry leaves and cow's urine can prevent or treat 
novel coronavirus. It is reported that these are circulated in the name of doctors, medical institutions and even the health department of Maharashtra. So in response, the health minister of state of Maharashtra has said that all such messages are false and messages talking about superfoods and home remedies for prevention and treatment have no scientific basis. And we have to know that at present, there is no specific treatment for novel coronavirus and patients are being given or administered only symptomatic treatment that is treatment is provided only based on their symptoms that are exhibited by the patients and what is requested from the people is to have a good hand hygiene and to have a coughing and sneezing etiquette and eating nutritious and well cooked food now let us see some of the myths that are spread across social media and the response of world health organization specifically one of the myths is that garlic prevents infection from novel coronavirus now world health organization has said that garlic is a healthy food that may have some antimicrobial properties but at present there is no evidence that eating garlic has protected people from the new coronavirus now the next myth is that putting sesame oil on the body blocks the virus from entering the body now who has clarified that sesame oil does not kill novel coronavirus in reply what they have said is that there are some chemical disinfectants that can kill the 2019 new coronavirus on surfaces um some of these disinfectants are chlorine based disinfectants ether solvents paracetic acid chloroform but what they have said is that these disinfectants have little or no impact on the virus if they are being applied on skin or under the nose and in specific world health organization has said that it can even be dangerous to put these chemicals on the skin now another myth is that antibiotics are effective in preventing and treating the new coronavirus now as we know and world health organization also have replied that antibiotics do not work against viruses because they are against bacterial infections and novel coronavirus is a virus so who has said that antibiotics should not be used as a means of prevention or treatment for the 2019 coronavirus however if individuals are hospitalized for this coronavirus they may receive antibiotics because bacterial co-infection is possible along with coronavirus infection so only in case of bacterial infection antibiotic is prescribed for treatment and uh, who organization has also said that as of now there is no specific medicine recommended to prevent or to treat the novel coronavirus r&d is still going on to find the right treatment or the appropriate treatment and uh, right now only symptomatic treatment is being provided so there is no specific treatment for novel coronavirus as of now and uh, these myths are being circulated and people can be definitely misinformed at the same time they can be also misleaded and administrators in the health department they are having a huge responsibility to tackle misinformation at the earliest possible and to prevent people falling prey to such misinformation so these are some of the information with reference to this news article to know more about the origin of 2019 new coronavirus or novel coronavirus and the symptoms of this viral infection and what way can this viral infection can be managed we request you to refer to our analysis on 23rd january 2020 with this we come to the end of analysis of today's news article we saw about some of the misinformation that are being spread across social media and the response given by the public health officials of maharashtra and specifically by the world health organization now let's move on to the analysis of next news article This news article is about some of the formal responses from the government of India with reference to the regulation and supervision of cooperative banks in our country. See these are formal responses which are in progress in the backdrop of financial irregularities some underreporting of total non performing assets from the side of Punjab and Maharashtra urban cooperative bank so in the context of analysis of this news article we'll see the present system of regulation of urban cooperative banks and some of the proposed changes and also few other information with reference to this news article the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference first let us see the present system of regulation of urban cooperative banks which are also known as primary cooperative banks when they are present in a state they will be registered as cooperative societies under the provisions of state cooperative societies act of a particular state if they have presence in more than one state they will be registered under the multi state cooperative societies act of 
when it is a state urban cooperative bank they are regulated and supervised by registrar of cooperative societies of a particular state when the presence is in more than one state then the regulation and supervision is done by the central registrar of cooperative societies now there may be a question whether uh, they come under the purview of reserve bank of india see the regulation and supervision by registrar of cooperative societies does not mean that the urban cooperative banks are outside the purview of rbi this is because the applicability of banking laws to cooperative societies began with the banking regulation cooperative societies rules of 1966 and these rules are based on several provisions of banking regulation act of 1949 and the reserve bank of india act of 1934 and time and again various governments do amend the state cooperative societies act so as to give rba an upper hand over the administration and uh, financial functioning of urban cooperative banks at the state level so under these provisions rba also regulates and supervises the banking functions of cooperative banks and within rba there is a separate department called as urban banks department this department has been entrusted with the functions such as you know regulatory functions supervisory functions and developmental functions with respect to urban cooperative banks regulatory functions include giving license to new urban cooperative banks for commencing their banking operations license to open new branches etc maintenance of cash reserve ratio statutory liquidity ratio etc when we come to supervisory functions here they will ensure that these urban cooperative banks conduct their affairs in the interest of depositors rbi will ensure that these banks comply with the regulatory framework prescribed by rbi and rbi supervision will also assess the solvency of the bank and also its liabilities so to ensure these functions urban banks department of rbi do undertake on site inspection of these banks when we say developmental functions of rbi it includes refinancing urban cooperative banks and uh, providing training to its middle and top management so this is done with the objective to ensure that the credit to reach out to small groups say for example cottage industries and this developmental actions will also improve the efficiency of management of cooperative banks so generally we can say that urban cooperative banks are actually under duality of control that is they are controlled by register of cooperative societies or central register of cooperative societies and also the reserve bank of india so there is a shared responsibility called as the duality of control however recently we saw a scam from the punjab and maharashtra cooperative bank and as a result there have been several questions over the regulation supervision with respect to urban cooperative bank and it is often said that a shared responsibility is nobody's responsibility and uh, rbi trusting the state authorities or the central cooperative societies registrar it was felt that there is a dilution in the regulation of these urban cooperative banks i know that the punjab and maharashtra cooperative bank is a scheduled urban cooperative bank which is scheduled under the rbi act of 1934 it is a multi state cooperative bank having its presence in states such as maharashtra gujarat union territory of delhi goa etc the bank is massive in terms of its capital and also the number of employees in 2019 it is reported that a large part of the bank's credit has went to a particular entity called as housing development and infrastructure limited and its associated entities and exposure of the bank's credit to this entity and associated entities was found to be violation of some of the regulatory norms or some of the usual banking jurisprudence and it was also found that the bank was under reporting its total exposure to the non performing assets these financial activities are in other words financial irregularities of this bank also went unnoticed when these financial activities were exposed it indicated failure in the regulatory system so rbi had to impose certain restrictions on the operations of this particular bank it brought in some limit on the amount which a depositor can withdraw so at the end of the day the depositors suffered parallelly there was also a fear that the bank could become insolvent and depositors could lose their money so as a result a reform in the regulation and supervision of urban cooperative banks were expected so it is in this context the union cabinet has approved some of the proposed amendments that are suggested to amend the banking regulation act of 1949 so it is reported that these amendments are expected to bring set of cooperative banks under the regulation of rbi while leaving the administrative matters at the hands of registrar of the cooperative societies
in addition to the regulation by RBA, it is also said that the auditing will also be done as per RBA's norms. And with respect to appointment of important positions, prior approval and permission of RBA is required. And RBA will also lay down qualifications for appointments in these cooperative banks. These include even positions such as chief executive officers. In addition to this, RBA will also deal with issues such as loan waivers. So all these means the urban cooperative banks will effectively come under the purview of Reserve Bank of India. And uh, by having all these uh, control, RBA can ensure that individuals with high morale and integrity and expertise in banking and financial sectors, they can become heads of these banks. And note that article stated that one of the proposed amendment is whenever an urban cooperative bank is under financial distress, RBA will get the power to supersede the board of the bank. The news article also states that along with these proposed amendments, the government has also decided to increase the insurance cover on bank deposits from the present rate of rupees 1 lakh to 5 lakh. This measure has been uh, decided to strengthen the financial stability of cooperative banks and to boost public confidence in the banking system to deposit money. See, till now, each depositor in a bank is insured up to a maximum of rupees 1 lakh. This is applicable for both principal and also to the interest amount held by the particular person as a deposit in the bank. Now, each depositor is to be insured up to a maximum of rupees 5 lakhs. And note that bank deposits are insured by Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Reserve Bank of India. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. We saw about the present regulatory structure with respect to urban cooperative banks. And we also saw some of the proposed amendments to make the financial administration of cooperative banks more transparent and also efficient. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is about recent developments associated with Scorpion class submarines that are being built in our country. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. First, let us see in brief about these Scorpion class submarines. See, these are submarines that are diesel electric attack submarines. They're actually developed by a French company called as Naval Group. Earlier it was called as DCNS. This company focuses on building naval defense systems. Earlier in 2005, Indian government and France, they entered into an agreement to manufacture six Scorpion class submarines for Indian Navy. The agreement was based on transfer of technology from the French company. When we say transfer of technology, here we refer to the transfer of technology of Scorpion class submarines to India and that these submarines will be built in India. So the task of building six Scorpion class submarines in India was assigned to one of India's leading defense public sector undertaking called as Mazagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited. Now this public undertaking, it comes under Ministry of Defense and all these six submarines are being built as a part of a project which is reportedly called as Project 75 India. See, it is an Indian Navy program. The purpose is to replace aging submarines with new submarines with state-of-the-art technology. Now let's discuss in brief about the six submarines and their present status. First of all, note that all these six Scorpion class submarines, they belong to Calvary class of Indian submarines. The first submarine of this project is called as INS Calvary. It was commissioned in the year 2017. The second one is called as INS Kanderi. It was commissioned in 2019. And third one is called as INS Karanj. According to news article, it will be inducted into the Indian Navy by December 2020. The remaining three submarines are uh, named under this project 75 as INS Vela, INS Wagir and INS Vakshir. The news article talks about uh, DRDO, Mazagon Dock and uh, Indian Navy having talks on fitting these Scorpion class submarines with air independent propulsion system. See the traditional diesel electric submarines or the conventional submarines they need to surface frequently to charge their batteries and they have an underwater endurance only for a duration of few days. And this air independent propulsion system, which is a new technology, it is said that this technology will vastly improve the underwater endurance of these submarines so that from few days they can withstand or they can stay in water for more time. And we have recently heard that DRDO has successfully developed a land-based prototype of air independent propulsion system. And we discussed in depth about this technology on our analysis on 31st October 2019. 
so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article we saw about the scorpion class submarines we saw about the agreement between india and the france government we saw about the agreement between government of india and france we saw about few information with reference to project 75 india we have come to the last session the practice questions discussion session to we'll see this question this question is with reference to the 2019 novel corona virus they have given two statements and are asking which of the above statements are correct first statement it is the same virus as severe acute respiratory syndrome now this statement is incorrect because 2019 novel corona virus is from same family of viruses that have caused severe acute respiratory syndrome and middle east respiratory syndrome but it is not the same virus that caused sars or uh, mers though it belongs to the same family of viruses it is not the same virus so the first statement is incorrect therefore you can eliminate option a and option c now come to the second statement older people and people with pre existing medical conditions such as diabetes and heart disease appear to be more at risk of developing severe disease due to novel corona virus infection this statement is correct and this is what has been mentioned by the world health organization with respect to persons who are vulnerable to be at risk because of novel corona virus infection So the correct answer for this question is option B two only. Now this question is with reference to urban cooperative banks. They have given two statements and are asking which of the above statements are correct. An urban cooperative bank operating in one state cannot start its branches in other states. Now this statement is correct because as of now there is no limitation that an urban cooperative bank operating in one state should restrict its operation only within that particular state. generally if you see urban cooperative banks come under two categories one is state level urban cooperative banks and the other is multi state level urban cooperative bank state level urban cooperative bank they will be registered under uh, state cooperative societies act of concerned state and will be regulated and supervised by registrar of cooperative societies of particular state in case of urban cooperative banks which are present in more than one state they will be registered under multi state cooperative societies act of 2002 regulated and supervised by central registrar of cooperative societies with respect to this we can mention the example of punjab and maharashtra urban cooperative bank which is a scheduled urban cooperative bank it is actually a multi state cooperative bank we can see the area of operations in states such as maharashtra karnataka goa gujarat andhra pradesh madhya pradesh and also in union territory of delhi so the first statement is incorrect so you can eliminate option a and c now come to second statement rbi regulations on crr and slr are applicable to urban cooperative banks now this statement is correct with respect to urban cooperative banks at present there is duality of control one is the control exercised by appropriate register of cooperative societies and the other is the control exercised by rbi through the urban bank department so this statement is actually correct this is actually based on the banking regulation cooperative societies rules 1966 which is framed under banking regulation act of 1949 and it is also based on relevant provisions under RBI act of 1934 so the correct answer for this question is option b two only now this question is with reference to project 75 i which has been recently in news they are asking it refers to which of the following the correct answer for this question is option b it is a project of the indian navy to replace aging submarines with new state of the art submarines This project 75 I have been in news with respect to building six Scorpion class submarines in India by Masagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited which is a public sector undertaking coming under Ministry of Defence. So the correct answer is option B. Now this question is with reference to Bureau of Indian Standards. They have given two statements and are asking which of the above statements are correct. Bureau of Indian Standards is a non-statutory body. When we say statutory body, it means that particular organization or institution or entity or body has been established by a statute or a law bureau of indian standards is a statutory body that is established by bureau of indian standards act of 1986 however at present the legislation under which it is established is bas act 2016 which repealed bas act 1986 so know that it is a statutory body established by section 3 of bas 2016 act Now the second statement it is the national standards body of india for the harmonious development of the activities of standardization marking and quality certification of goods now the statement is correct if you see the preamble of uh, the bas act of 2016 you can find this statement the correct answer for this question is option b two only 
with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video click the like button comment share and subscribe to shankar ai's academy youtube channel for more updates and content on civil services exam preparation we'll meet you tomorrow